to reiterate is, is Brian's statement. He said this, uh, I, I, he did get a lot of attention, but there were no critical or material findings for any of the systems. I think that that's very important. You know, one of the major reasons why you go out and have an audit is to say, well, you know, we've promised but almost 400,000 people this benefit, and we're responsible for providing the benefits to those 400,000 people. How are we doing? Are we doing a due diligence? Are the numbers that we're given, which are fairly complex, are they reasonable? And the answer is yes. In each of the four reports, we provided a statement that said, we believe that the liabilities and the cost contributions that were computed by your actuary represent a fair representation of the liabilities of each of those systems. So you can rest assured that your numbers are solid. Now, from that point, we actually take another critical look at things and say, well, okay, are there things that we think you should look at that might possibly improve the valuation process? Now, some of them might be a little nitpicky, and you'll see that there are a lot of, a lot of little things in there. We're not trying to do it just to be nitpicky, but we're trying to do that to, to take a look at it for your consideration, for the actuary's consideration, to actually improve the product. For PERS, we had 21 study items, 32 best practice items. And as I mentioned, in our opinion, the liabilities shown in the June 30, 2010 report fairly represent a reasonable estimate of the liabilities of PERS. We actually went through, as Brian said, and replicated the valuation for each of the systems. This is a, a slide of the PERS. Here you can see the, the numbers developed by GRS, the numbers developed by CMC, which is Kavanaugh McDonald Consultants, and the differences. In total, the total actuarial accrued liability differed by 0.36%. Very, very close. The total present value of benefits, 0.56%, about a half a percent. The unfunded liability, now this is unusual. You'll see that we have these pass-fail ranges up here for the accrued liability and the present value of benefits. 2% for the total present value of benefits, 5% for the accrued liability. We don't have one for the unfunded liability because a lot of times you get a leveraging effect. You could be within 2% on the unfunded liability, excuse me, on the, total, on the total accrued liability, but then when you factor in the assets, which don't change, you could actually have twice the unfunded liability just from a small change in the total accrued liability. So we don't put a range around that and oftentimes see that kind of leveraging. We didn't even see that here in the PERS calculations. We were within 1% on the unfunded accrued liability. On the normal cost, we were spot on. I don't think I've ever seen an audit we were spot on on the normal cost. Now, we weren't on the other, uh, other three systems, but we were reasonably close on the other three systems. This one, we were spot on. This is, of course, the largest system, and so we can get that rule of large numbers there, and small rounding errors will factor out a lot easier in a larger system. In total, uh, the total contribution that we would have computed, not including the projection that Brian talked about, was within 1% of what Kavanaugh McDonald computed. So we think that this is a very, very reasonable, close approximation. Now, Brian talked about this projection. He gave you an example. I'll just mention, this is the last slide on PERS, but I'll just mention that in the appendix for PERS, we actually have a couple of illustrations, one with the projection that Brian talked about, one without the projection that Brian talked about. And you can kind of go through the numbers. I won't go through those today, but you can go through the numbers on your own and see what the change is. There's one in the PERS. There's one in the highway report and they actually go in opposite directions. So you can kind of see that illustration because they, one system had a loss in the in-between years, the other one had a gain in the in-between years. Summary of signing findings for the highway. Again, no critical or material issues. We had 23 study issues, 34 best practice issues. And again, we think this is a fair representation. Uh, one, of the, one of the recommendations uh, for highway that you'll see is the Discussion on the additional contribution that is in highway. We felt the, um, it took us a little while to figure out what was going on with the additional contributions. We were able to figure it out. We thought a little bit more disclosure on that and how that operates and affects the contribution would be helpful. When you look at these numbers here for the replication, I'm going to draw you right down to the bottom here, the total employer contribution. Those numbers probably are not going to look familiar to you. Those numbers actually include the additional contribution. Where the numbers that you're probably used to seeing, I think we're in the 35% range, factor that additional contribution out. And so that kind of, it made it a little mysterious in the valuation report. We recommend it actually just giving a little bit more disclosure. Not that there was anything wrong that was done with it, but just provide a little bit more disclosure. 
So when we made our estimates, again, we came very, very close on the total present value of benefits. Uh, we were seven one hundredths of a percent off from the Kavanaugh McDonald calculations. The total unfunded, we were within 2%. The normal cost, we were within 2%. And the total contribution, we were within 1%. So things, look, again, look very, very good there. My, I, I, I tend to get a little excited and I talk fast. Am I going OK? Or we too fast, too slow? Everything's OK, slurp. I like saying that, slurp. There were 30 study items and 19 best practice items there. Uh, and uh, in this one, again, it fairly represents the liabilities of the system. Uh, what we found in this one was that there was a difference in the data, in the reported data between what these members were reported for in the PERS data versus the SLURP special data. And when we approached this, we thought, well, okay, then that means that they, some of these people have some non-SLURP PERS data. And the way we read the statutes, and we did actually go through all the statutes, the way we read them, we thought, well, that must satisfy eligibility. And we went through the Kavanaugh McDonald uh, calculations. It didn't look like they were using that to satisfy eligibility because it wasn't in their data file that they provided. And I will mention that when we do the replication, even though we have the data from the system, our replicated numbers are based off of the data that Kavanaugh McDonald used and already scrubbed. And so there are some slight differences. And when you go through the first part of each of the report, we kind of reconcile the data that they actually used which, with what was reported by the system. And do an evaluation of the scrubbing technique. Say, well, okay, these are reasonable edits here. So we were comparing two different data files. Kavanaugh McDonald file with the PERS data file, and we used the Kavanaugh McDonald file, but then we went back and we appended it to grab in the PERS non slurp service for these members to determine eligibility. And it would affect the, the uh, 25 now, 25 now. I don't think it affects the age and service calculation because they would hit the age at the, at the same point in time, but it would affect some of these people for the 25 and out. This didn't affect a lot of people, but it did affect a few people. So we recommended that Kavanaugh and McDonald take a look at this, review this, and possibly change that process. We did verify that that was the case with them and with, with uh, the system. They did tell us that that, data, that service is eligible for eligibility under the SMART benefits. Other than that, things, again, look very good. Uh, the actual accrued liability was within 2%. The total present value of benefits was within 1%. And here we see a little bit of that leveraging because their unfunded liability is almost 9% away. And that, that again, we're very close in the total accrued liability, but we subtract out the assets and we have a small unfunded liability, and so small differences are a larger percentage. The normal cost was just over 2% away. Again, that passed, and the total contribution was within 6%. So everything looks very good. Now, as, a smaller, as you get smaller systems and you start making small differences, you're going to see bigger variations between retirement, uh, between actuarial firms. So nothing is alarming here. We're very comfortable with the results, and we've made those recommendations to change the way they're accounting for PERS, the service and eligibility, and also the vesting code. Can we go back to that previous page? I have a question. Sure. I just want to make sure I understand this. Um, for those individuals that are in SLURP, they are also members of PERS. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. And so would it be correct to say that if the employer contribution rate for those individuals for PERS goes to a little over 12.9%, that the state or the taxpayers have to pay an additional 7.82% under your scenario, 7.40% under Kavanaugh McDonald for the additional benefits that those members of SLURP get? Yes. So the 7.4% that Kavanaugh McDonald says is over and above the 12.9% that the state already pays for those individuals who are in person. Correct, because because you're getting, the members of the legislature and the lieutenant governor are getting two benefits, one from PARS and a second additional one from the supplemental legislative retirement plan. So they're getting benefits so they're over getting, and above what school teachers get and over and above what mm -hmm. police officers get and over and above what our firemen get, et cetera. Yes. Well, the, the, the state highway are, have a different system. They have different benefits. Right. But you're talking municipal firemen? Right. 
Go on? Yes. Okay, uh, MERS. This one tripped us up a little bit. Uh, we, were, we were really struggling with the MERS, trying to reconcile our numbers. In total, we looked like we were really close with, with Kavanaugh McDonald. And at the last minute, we discovered that, you know, we didn't have the right data. <laughs> we, we were actually given the 2010 data, and we were auditing the 2009 valuation. So now, as you go through this, this, was, this is the one odd system out. We were auditing the, the September 30th, 2009 valuation. And so we had to go back to the PERS data. So this is the one system where we actually used the PERS data to measure our liabilities and compare it with the CAVMAC results that were in the valuation. So this one was a little bit different in that range. We came very, very close to all of them. The one that stands out here, as you look at this, is the uh, Clinton. And that one was, was pretty far away. In total, we were within a half percent. Now, what I will tell you is that we do know, and, and I've had some conversations with staff, that there were some valid edits to the data that PERS gave Kavanaugh McDonald. One of those uh, edits being there were some retired members that were reported on the active file. Uh, one person could account for this entire difference in the uh, Clinton calculations. So this didn't raise any concerns knowing that we weren't using the final edited data. So we, we looked through this and we thought, you know, this is, again, this is very good result. Uh, we think that, that it fairly represents the liabilities of the system. As we were going through this one, again, now Brian talked about that projection method. You're actually doing that in this retirement system. So the, the MERS actually goes through a calculation where they say, okay, well, what was the, what was the military that was determined uh, that's going to start the day after the valuation. It was determined from the prior valuation. Let's use that and kind of project forward and see what the remaining unfunded liability is and then come up with a new millage rate using that information. Uh, we think that that could be clarified a little bit. It wasn't crystal clear how they arrived at that. I actually had to get on the phone with them and go through the calculations. And after we did that, we still weren't convinced that they were using the 2% load correctly in the end results. And in the, uh, in the MERS valuation, you'll see a little example of what we think could actually be a better presentation of that along with the comparison with that 2% load. I think we did it for the Loxine. Just to kind of take a look at that. Uh, so we're recommending that be studied and reevaluated just to make sure that everything is being accounted for correctly. We also think in this system that you know there, there are two uh, things we think you should review. One is the investment return assumption. This system is a closed system, so it differs from all the other retirement systems. And so we have some discussions, and we can go into that as, as much detail as you want uh, today, but we do have some discussions about that in the actual report. We understand that right now the assets are, in fact, commingled with the other systems. And so you are, in fact, getting whatever the other systems are. But as Brian and I were talking about this, Brian coined the term that you're, you're kind of borrowing liquidity from the other systems in order to obtain liquidity for this system by commingling those assets. If you didn't have that access to commingle those assets, you probably wouldn't be investing in the same asset allocation as you would be in the other systems, and you might not be able to achieve the same rate of return. And so we, we recommend that that one be reviewed, and I understand there's actually some consideration of splitting them out going forward anyways, and so that might be timely to, to look at all that at the same time. The other thing is because this is a closed plan, you have very, very few actives. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of time with the active member review because they really aren't going to matter. You've got about 30 actives and 2,000 retirees. The actives just don't do a lot to the, the end results. Uh, it's really the retirees that are important here, but also the assets. And for this one, we think uh, that you should consider using a market value of assets as opposed to the smooth value of assets. We don't have a problem with the smooth value of assets in general or for any of the other systems, although Brian mentioned that there are some technical issues that we think should be reviewed. This one, we would recommend considering going to a market value of assets to do the valuation or shortening the smoothing, maybe due to the two-step process. Shorten the smoothing for a couple of years, go to a two or three year smoothing, and eventually go to a market value of assets. As those assets dwindle, you have less and less assets. You don't have time for the smoothing to actually correct itself out as these funds start to dry up, you know, which, is, which is what happens in a closed plan. 
And so we want you know, a, a more close representation of what the real assets are. Brian, do you think I missed anything? Are you still there? Maybe he's not bailed on you. He bailed on you. No, I think uh, that covered it pretty well. I was going to say in this situation, you might think of the MRS as being like a 70-year-old person. And um, if that person were to say, well, I have hundred thousand dollars in the bank, but I'm counting it as one hundred and thirty eight thousand so that I can, you know, make my withdrawals to pay my, you know, expenses, you might not quite think that was some financial planning on that person's part. Because the expenses have to be paid now and the fact that he's counting it as a higher number, you can't really take it to the bank and they won't let you withdraw. And and also on the um on the uh, slip uh, system um, I couldn't quite hear everything, but did you mention that, that um, when they're being valued in the PER system, that different assumptions are being used, and when they're being valued in the SLRP system? Uh, I did not mention that. I, actually, I thought of it, and then it, 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 uh, <laughs> I lost that train of thought. Yeah, that's right. Um, in the experience study, there was one experience study that we reviewed for all of them. Special assumptions are developed for the SLRP folks, those people in the legislature, but they're not used when they're doing the PERS valuation. The assumptions are used to be uh, basically with the same as, as all, everybody else in PERS. The assumptions that are used in the slurp valuation are different. In fact, you know, one of the things is that people retire once every four years and people quit once every four years. And so those are very different from the, from the PERS assumptions. We're only talking about 100 people out of 170,000 people in the PERS valuation. So this is not a material issue at all, but it does present a consistency issue. And so we think, well, you already went through the exercise of developing those assumptions, and we, we talked about this in the full reports. You went through the exercise of developing those assumptions for the SLRP, you might as well use them for those people in the PERS valuation. Did I miss anything else, Brian? No, well, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Any questions? I'd like to go back, if it's okay, uh, to uh, one where you had on the PERS plan, add additional data to retirees file to value COLA. Yes. Under that, review operation of COLA with option combinations. Yes. Would you comment? Sure. On that? Uh, this really came out when we were looking at the test life cases. And, and where it figures in is that you've got this uh, COLA that's simple for a few years and then converts to compound. At a, at a specific age. And I won't say the age because I kept getting infused because it's, it's different for highway. I think it's, it's 55 for PERS. 65 for PERS. 65 for highway. Um, when, we, when we looked at the test life cases and the person was a straight life, meaning that the benefit was only payable over the member's life, everything was, was pretty clear and we were able to figure out exactly what happened. When a beneficiary was in receipt of it after having uh, started receiving the remainder of a joint and survivor benefit, 50% joint and survivor or uh, whatever <coughs> have you, it became less clear exactly what was there was the accumulated COLAs and the current benefit and the original benefit. And so what was missing was how many of those accumulated COLAs were simple and how many were compound. Or if they were still in the simple phase, when did it go to compound? And so it's, it's left to the actuary to kind of guesstimate that process, where that happens. And because, you know, a 50% joint survivor, you don't have a uniform benefit over the, the past, guessing where that converted based on the information of the, the total accumulated colas to date, plus the current benefit to date and the original benefit, you could come up with different answers with different methods. And so our recommendation there was to actually just add the information. Put on the file what status they're in. Are they in, are they in um, the simple phase? Are they in the compound phase? If they're in the compound phase, what is the base for what they're compounding on? So just put that out there. And that way we don't have to come up with a method to figure it out, and we wouldn't have two different methods between two different actuarial firms. The issue with the um, operation of the combinations was and again, this came out in the test life cases. We had uh, one of the test life cases, I think, was a 
a level annuity with a 50% joint survivor benefit. So we had a changing benefit and a 50% joint survivor benefit and a pop-up. So we had all three pieces to that benefit. And it became very confusing because this person at some point in the future uh, was going to convert from a simple COLA to a compound COLA. Well, on the benefit that they were currently getting, it was pretty obvious. On the benefit after the change date, <coughs> it wasn't quite as obvious. On the benefit after the change date that the beneficiary was going to get was even less obvious. And on the, benef on the benefit after the change date that the member was going to get after the beneficiary died, the pop-up amount, was even less, less obvious. And so we, we actually struggled to kind of figure out what that was. We came up with a method. It was clearly different from what Kavanaugh and McDonald was using. Uh, in total, it didn't represent a material difference, so we didn't go into any further. But we thought, well, if you, if you added some detail to that, and then Kavanaugh and McDonald reviewed how they were actually approaching that, then we thought that that would actually improve the process. Does that answer those questions? Yes, I have one more. Okay. Do you think that it's accurate? It's been our custom that each year uh, we indicate uh, how much the uh, retirees were paid on their base benefit, and then we list a total sum of their uh, COLA payments accumulated over ever how many years they're there. Is that unusual? Um, is that unusual? I, I want to say no, but I also want to say the provision of having this simple cola that changes to a compound cola, I, I haven't seen that before. Brian, have you seen that before? Other than in Mississippi? I have seen that uh, one other time. Um, one other time. So I, I would say that it's somewhat unusual. So, so the structure of your cola is somewhat unusual. Uh, to begin with. So, you know, I, we work with a lot of other systems that would say, okay, well, here's the benefit, here's the accumulated COLA, and here's the total. But they don't have this movement from simple to compound in the process, and so it's easy to figure out what the past COLAs were versus what the future COLAs were. Uh, that, that wouldn't affect the total, you know, regardless of how they received it. We, we list in our bookkeeping and our auditing the total uh, COLA that's paid to each the, the total of colas paid to each uh, recipient. I would say that's and pretty it's, common. And it's, uh, if it's accumulated over time, so like in, when we have our 2011 audit, uh, the cola we show how much it was spent, and in that, if a person can retire 15 years, then the, his total accumulated cola is in that number. Right. That's right. So I always thought that was kind of unusual. Like that, that would be like if you're working and you get a cost of living adjustment or allowance, then that becomes a part of your base. And then your books would just simply reflect how much you paid for the annual COLA, not the multi annual COLAs. The simple versus the compound? No. No, no. These simple compounds are all together. Uh huh. So, uh, I guess I'm not, I'm not following what you mean, well, the annual versus the, the, the multi. Here I am, I'm a retiree, and I've been retired many years. Okay. Okay, well in that total, uh, the, ever how many uh, payment cut, uh, well, it'll be 19 years this year, I can't believe that, but it is. <laughs> but in that total, I'm talking to about, about it will be the, the total amount of money that I was paid each year for a COA. Uh -huh. Instead of a book showing just what I'm being paid for 2011. Segregating the, the accumulated COLA versus identifying the annual increase in the COLA. Yeah, that, that's really. I've seen other systems that do right. that. I, right. I, I, I think that that's, that's not pretty common. Really. Right, it's not yeah, an I actuarial think that's pretty issue. common. Um, it's not an yeah, that's more of an accounting issue. Right. I mean, from an actuarial standpoint, I don't think we would actually care. Uh, um, just, but, but what. What trips us up is that, <coughs> let's say you're, you're now getting the 3% compound COLA. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> we can't look at your total accumulated COLA and your current benefit and figure out, you know, easily what it's 3% of. 
how it was calculated. How it's calculated. You could if you had the age data in front of you. We can estimate it, but if you've ever gotten any ad hoc colas in between, I think there were some that were paid out in the past, that screws everything up. So it, it that's what we were, you know, that's that was the point of our statements was get that information in there so that it, it becomes easier for us to figure out what the base is. But I don't think that's an unusual thing to separate that out. I've seen other systems that do that. Any other questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Do we need to accept this? Accept the audit? And then the section to accept the actuary and audit? And Mr. Chairman, as a matter of information, two things. One, I'll remind you that uh, the first actuary and audit that Carlos had was for the 2004 fiscal year. It was done in 2005. And it is that having an actuary and audit is a form of planning Since the last board meeting uh, to the circuit court, that 
that's from a non-vested uh, claimant who was seeking duty-related disability and was denied. Uh, we've had dispositions in four cases. Uh, the, the board was reversed in two of those in Walker. Because the circuit court reversed uh, the decision to deny disability and first has filed a notice of appeal to the Supreme Court in that case. And then uh, Purs v. Warlow recently, just last week, the Court of Appeals uh, affirmed the circuit court by uh, saying that there was not substantial evidence for the board's decision to deny disability benefits. Uh, we did have a victory in the circuit court in Thurman v. Purs. The, the, uh, the court found uh, that the board's decision to deny killed in the line of duty uh, spousal benefits uh, was appropriate. Uh, that involved a fireman who was found dead on a public walking track of a heart attack a lot while on duty. Uh, they, the court held that it was not a killed in the line of duty uh, of death. And lastly, we had an agreed order to dismissal in one disability case. Uh, there have been no new securities litigation cases filed and no significant action in any of the new uh, securities litigation cases. Uh, any questions? Questions from the council? Uh, entertain a motion to accept the litigation report. So moved. Yeah. Sorry. And move the second to accept the litigation for all favor say aye. Aye. 